So last week, just to recap, we did, go ahead. A little louder. What's well, louder? <laughs> <laughs> Any better? A little louder? Keep talking, okay. Say when you, when it's fine, okay. So last week, I know we, just a recap of what we did. We did body scan, scan the body. We did a little taste of breath meditation and just also practicing with the whole body as it is. A little bit more, yes? Mm -hmm. So we're going to do a little bit of that to revisit again today. And then we will also be covering just mental activity. We'll talk about that more. Any better? It was better last week. Okay, so I'm going to. All right, all right. Maybe the way it is. Oh. I put the batteries in, but that's not as been charged. Sorry about that. It's all right. I'll, I'll speak louder. So we, you know, um, this week, today, and then uh, in the weeks ahead, we're going to give more time for practicing. So um, let's start. We'll just do a body scan for 10 minutes or so so find a... i gotta turn it back down <laughs> you heard that one right <laughs> so give it a minute so <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay, now just let's just do a test. How's it now? Same. Just keep just go testing one, two, test three. one, two, three. Test one, two, three. Just keep talking. Right? Keep talking. Keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> Any better? Yes. Okay. I'll talk. I'll keep talking. All right. So. One way or another, find a position that supports your body, that is grounding. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's just relax, take a seat, whether it is in the cushion or on the chair. Just let things be as they are. And as we make the body comfortable, adjust the body, also let's ensure the mind is settled. So we're gonna take a deep breath all the way from the diaphragm up. Deep breath out. And do one or two as needed, if needed. And we will just intend to stay present in the moment and put all the worries and the joys and the burdens, everything down for this moment. So let's bring out the awareness to the top of the head. Just feel the head as its entirety, feel the head, see how it feels. Maybe the, the vents in the room, the cool air or the weight of the head. 
Just notice how it feels. In the forehead, down the entire face. Any sensations in the face, we can just feel and notice. We really don't have to do anything to change or make adjustments. Just feel what's there. Feel the eyes, the cheeks, the brows, the ears the nose, you can feel the air on top of the nose. Without adding or changing or demanding, just tuning in to the sensations in the face. Down to the mouth and the jaw. Just feeling if there is any tension or relaxation or maybe neutral. Bringing down the attention down to the neck, the throat, and the shoulder area. Times we tend to carry a lot in the shoulders and the neck, the neck. Just feeling in what's there, letting it be. And if anything, any, any burden drops by itself just because we are connecting, that's fine. Just letting things be consciously connecting to what is there. Feeling the shoulders shoulder blades, the arms, noticing how the clothes in our body and if the arms are folded or where they are resting, down to our hand, the palms, the fingers, just feeling the sensations Feeling the air. Feeling all of the upper torso. Chest. We can notice the movement in the chest as we are breathing in and out. Feeling the mid the middle back and the spine, also in the front side, feeling all of the stomach and the emotional center, our gut. Just taking a minute here and really connecting in with our gut.
And we hold so much. There's a lot of activity and many organs that keep us tired, keep working and keep us alive tirelessly. As we are aware of the sensations in the gut and feeling all of our stomach, we could just notice how much everything is doing what it is supposed to do on its own without us doing anything. So we just are connecting with what is and bring the attention down to the pelvis area and the sit bones. Kind of feel the pressure of the body sitting, the contact with the chair. Letting things be and feeling how it is. Moving down to the ties and both legs. It's a sitting posture. It's connecting in how our legs are all the way down to the feet. The contact areas where Maybe the cushion or the chair or the floor. The temperature. Just feeling what is there, feeling the sensations as they are. Feeling the rootedness of the posture. And we're going to take a couple of minutes. Bring the awareness to the entire body. As we breathe in, we feel the entire body sitting in the whole body. As we breathe out, we let the awareness be aware of the whole body. Include all the sensations everywhere from the top of the head to the middle section of the body where we are feeling the chair all the way to our feet. Everything can be included. Just breathing in and out for another minute here, feeling the whole body.
And if we find ourselves distracted by thinking or pain or any other thing that takes us from the present moment, we just remember to come back, breathe in, breathe out, feeling the entire body as it is. The majority of the practice is just recognizing what's here and remembering when we are moved away to the future or the past, just to come back, just being patient and being okay to begin again. So we'll be here for another minute or so. Feeling the body, the whole body as it is. If the eyes has, have been closed, we can slowly open the eyes. So feel free to stand up, stretch. So one of the reflections that we were discussing last week was just to reflect how or why you, you each or, or all of us, why we decide to come to this class, what's the motivation, just explore, reflect, and see what happens in addition to all the practice. I'm sure you've been practicing all week. 
Um, so I just want to touch that point of why meditate. Um, our usual tendency in how we relate to experiences, maybe you guys have noticed this, if it is painful, we really want to do everything possible to avoid that. If it is fantastic, we want to cling to it. And if it is boring, neutral, and we just want to distract ourselves. This is usually what we do. Whether we are aware that's what we are doing or not, we don't notice just neutral experiences, which is the majority of our life. It's not too painful. It's not amazing. But most of it is just neutral. So regardless of what, re what reasons you had to want to learn this new skill and learn in a new way to relate to life, just the capacity to be able, the willingness to sit down and want to, to take inventory of this life. I think I just want to be still for a moment and connect with the body. That's, that's a big aspiration. And especially at first, a lot would come back. It's like, what am I doing here? And painful experience is not easy to relate. All the aches and pains that if we were moving around that we would not hear, it really wants more attention now. So, but when we decide to, you know, put things down means we actually relate to experience without adding too much coloring and just this sucks I don't like this oh my god this is amazing you know if we just put that down and say what is here like curious and interested to find out you know slowly we would see we can actually be at peace with the conditions as they are like yeah, the knee hurts, but it's fine. I'm just going to sit for the next 10 minutes. Like, I don't have to shift my legs. Maybe, maybe I have to, but, but there isn't this constant tendency, like I need to change. I need to find the best flavored ice cream next or whatever kind of um, relationship with experience. And I know last week we touched this a bit and Mark was talking about what we have is just all the six senses, including the thinking and that experience in the here and now, there is nothing outside of that. And how do we relate to it? So, you know, as you continue the practice, you can explore and see what you find when you connect with experience without too much resistance, without too much clinging to each one, and it will come in time. Um, so I will pass this to you, Mark. I don't know if you have additional things, but we will talk about and explore mental activity today. So Mark will cover that. Thank you, Meski. So you probably have discovered, you know, when we start paying attention to our life, there are relatively gross, obvious things that the knowing mind knows. 
And then there's the relatively subtle qualities of mind that we tend not to notice as well. And we wanna cultivate an awareness, a stability of present moment awareness that's sensitive to the full range from gross to subtle, <clears throat> pleasant, unpleasant, inner experience like mental activity, external experience such as seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, tasting. But all of it is just this being known, this experience being known. But we create these maps to help kind of illuminate our habits, you know, like that we're never aware that thoughts are being known. Of course, thoughts, the mind is thinking all the time. That's what part of what the mind does, it thinks. But we tend not to be aware. Oh, that's just a thought being thought. Or when is the last time you just simply noticed, oh, there's this mood being known. Like, do you know, can you sense whatever the particular mood or attitude is right now in your mind, in your heart? Can you be aware of that? <clears throat> and let's say your mood is kind of neutral. Well, that's an experience too. We can be aware of the neutrality of my mood, or maybe you're just, it's just a little flat, nothing's happening. Okay, that numbness, that flatness is like this. Or maybe your elevated mood, you're happy or excited about something. Okay, it's like this. So even though, you know, in our training, like earlier tonight, Mesky guided us through the body scan meditation, this is one of the techniques you can use. And like, it's relatively concrete because we're training the mind to say, honey, open to the sensations in the head. Feel the air touching the skin of the face. Feel the sensations in the shoulders, you know, part by part like that. And the attention connects with the object. It's a relatively gross experience gross in the sense it's relatively easy for the knowing mind to realize their sensations in every part of the body right and then at the end mesky had us feeling the whole body together so that's like a training and often initially for the training we use a lot of those grosser more obvious objects bringing awareness it's not even so much that we're bringing awareness to the experience. The experience, like when we were feeling our shoulders or chest or whatever part, where is that experience being known? Here. So we, you know, language doesn't always line up with reality. Oh, I brought my attention to my chest. Well, what is it? Awareness is over here and the chest is over there and you had to bring them, you had to bring them together. Is that actually your subjective experience? Like a lot, of, a lot of us are touching one hand, touching the other hand. So just do that or whatever your hand's touching. When we bring our awareness to that simple experience of touching, where is that experience being known? Here. So we don't even need the idea that, oh, I got to bring my awareness down into my hands in order to feel it. Did you have to do that? No. Because that sensitivity and the experience that the sensitivity is sensitive to, it's already happening. So in English, imperfectly, the knowing mind is already sensitive to touch, the touch of the two hands, right? It's the same with our mood. It's the same with mental activity, the emotions that are present. There's already sensitivity. Like one way just to imagine it, it's just a metaphor, but it's like the space of the present moment, the space of my heart, the mind, the present moment, is the space itself is sensitive. 
So whatever arises in the present moment, whatever, wherever attention is inclined to attend to, there will be knowing there. So if we get curious about the mood, we'll notice, or the qualities of the mind, we'll notice those qualities. If we get interested in sound, we'll notice hearing. All of that happens here in the space of the present moment. And the reason I'm, I bring this up, because it can, we can wrongly think that it takes a lot of work to bring my attention to the breath or to bring my attention to this part of the body or to bring my attention to the mood. Because conceptually, we think of reality as having locations. You know, my mood is over here, my foot's down there, you know. But actually, everything is being known in the mind. And one way to think of it, I forget if I mentioned this last week, like our subjective experience, that's really what Meski and I are unpacking. You know, we're using the Buddhist teachings to support us being more and more intimate with our subjective experience, reality, the way it already is. We're not looking for a special reality. We're just interested in connecting or being intimate or being open with the way it is. And what we find in terms of our subjective experience is there are two things that are always happening. And I might, I might have briefly mentioned this last week. There's sensitivity or there's knowing and there's stuff being known. And you can't really tease those apart. Like going back to the, whatever your hand or hands are touching, you know, that's an experience being known. There's a knowing or sensitivity. And what that sensitivity is knowing is touch. The hands making contact or the warmth of the touch or the hardness or softness of the touch, you know, whatever the particular characteristics of that contact. Right. And, and subjectively there's knowing of that experience and the two things, the knowing and the touching that's being known are related. Can't like know the knowing without knowing what knowing is knowing, you know what I mean? But we do know that there's knowing, right? Because how else would we know the touch? There's sensitivity to touch. So is there sensitivity to the quality, qualities, the mood, attitude? It's funny when we start to pay, when we get curious about the mood or the thoughts or the qualities of the mind gets really quiet <laughs> that's one way to quiet your mind down get interested in it it's actually a, a good sign in meditation when your awareness of mental activity doesn't scare it away like to it's a real sign of progress that you're not suppressing thinking because you know, we have this uh, old habit that thinking's bad. You know, now that I'm a Buddhist, now that I'm interested in meditation, no more thoughts. But it's a little bit like weather, you know, it's just like the mind, just like wind moves, air moves, call it wind, thoughts move, emotions move. Attitudes come and go, moods come and go. This is the very nature of the mind in the same way that the sensations of the body, the felt sense of the body is always in motion. We may think that what I'm feeling in my body is static, but when you look at it with a balanced, uh, curious attention, you see that the sensations, it's always a river of flow. It's never like a static experience of sensation. Thoughts move, sensations move. Even seeing, like it, when instead of like fixing your attention on a particular visual experience, when you just have that regular, soft, 
gaze. So you're not really looking, you're just aware of the visual experience. You see, it's just like alive with the change. It's not a static thing. Same with sound. Sound is like a ri river. Smell and taste the same. So we have, like we talked about last week and Meski mentioned earlier tonight, we have these six sense gates, the five physical senses, all rivers changing, flowing, sound, smell, taste, touch, and sight, and then the river of mental activity. And in a way, all of those rivers are moving here in the space of the present moment, the sensitive space. You could say the space of the mind, because that's where experience is known. When I touch the bench, you know, conceptually, I think the touching is happening here, but my actual experience, like even the idea of the, the location over here is an idea being known in my mind. I point it to my head, but it's not really here, is it? It's here, you know, in the middle of our sub subjective experiencing. And this is a real change. It's really this... Uh, Part of what we're going to get during this, these four weeks, and we'll do a guided meditation in just a moment, is we're moving from, <clears throat> excuse me, our experience being dominated by my idea of my experience to a more direct, intimate, subjective experiencing. Like, what is it actually to be sensitive? <clears throat> and, <clears throat> excuse me. One of the things we begin to notice is that it's always something being known here and now, right here, always here in the middle. Everything is happening here in the middle. Even I think of my home, seven blocks that way, that thought isn't seven blocks that way. It's here now. I think about the past, even you know my first memory when I was four years old or something, that's here and now. And that's a characteristic of reality, that it's here and now, that everything is something being known here and now. So we'll do the breath meditation that Meski led us in last week. We'll do that. I'll, I'll lead us again. And then <clears throat> once we're somewhat settled in the middle of the sit, I'll just move us through these six sense gates. And just, you know, for maybe a minute for each of the six sense gates. So you just take a, a moment and notice smelling, notice hearing, notice thinking, you know, each of the six. But the idea, because I don't want to talk a lot during the guided meditation, the idea is to notice it in the way that the Buddha asks us to frame it. Because this way of framing, he says, lines up with our subjective experience. So we're we're kind of learning to harmonize with reality instead of harmonizing with the way we were trained to think about things, like through culture, which is a dualistic way. It's like there's me somewhere back here having an experience out there. But that's not actually a reality. It's an idea we've been programmed with, and it has implications stress <laughs> because it doesn't line up with reality the idea that there's somebody back there having an experience out there it just doesn't line up so everything's clunky and the the term for that we usually translate as suffering it's not a great translation for the word dukkha which you know is a word from the you know indian uh, continent way back at the time of the buddha dukkha uh, modern Hindi is related, you know, Sanskrit, Pali language has this term dukkha. And it actually comes from uh, when an axle is out of true and the cart just doesn't work very well, you know? And that's the thing. It's like we've got an understanding the way who we think we are, what we think is going on here, but it doesn't really work. 
And so the Buddha's medicine for us human beings that are experiencing a lot of stress in life is, well, you need an understanding that's in alignment with reality. <laughs> because living your life with an understanding that doesn't fit, it's like those toys we give our two and three-year-olds, you know, where you got to get the peg and you got to find the right hole to put it in. Is it a star? Is it a square? Is it round? You know, and we're trying to use an understanding that doesn't quite line up <clears throat> with our, our lived experience. <clears throat> and so we have this underlying existential anxiety and this underlying existential sense of lack. So we just try harder to get the peg in the wrong hole, you know, because that's all we know. And the Buddhist teachings are really saying, <clears throat> well, because he's just sharing what he had come to understand in his own life. If you cultivate this stability <clears throat> and continuity of present moment awareness, it will force your understanding to align with reality. And to help you out, I'll even articulate what that understanding is. It doesn't help us completely, but it, it kind of gives us some confidence. And the very short way of saying like, well, what did the Buddha, how did he articulate that understanding that lines up with reality? And it's something like, it's all nature. It's all a natural process. Everything is natural processes interrelated natural processes there's nothing outside of these lawful conditional natural unfoldings nothing stands outside of it it's nature not self not something not something dualistic something outside of these natural processes so what that's what we're doing with our awareness we're going to study these six movements sound sight smell taste touch mental activity as unfolding natural processes lawful always one thing leading to the next like an unfolding of cause and effect and then even the knowing the knowing doesn't even stand apart. Like we might, well, I'm, I must be the awareness that knows these six movements, these six sense gates. But like I was saying, the, the knowing and the experience that's being known can't really be teased apart. And what that does is it just by observing that way and really seeing how that lines up with reality, our experience, it just causes attachment and identification and obsessiveness and fixation and all of those sort of tight habits of the mind just begin to fall away because they don't line up with reality. They don't make sense when the mind is aligning with reality. And so delusion is the idea that something is something when in fact it's not like that I'm like this when it doesn't line up. So then there's that dissonance and we call that stress, existential uneasiness, you know, where we never really get, we never get to that place where the heart's peaceful and easeful and feeling uh, content, which is interesting. You know, even those of us who are relatively privileged and fortunate and healthy, you know? Is your heart completely at ease? And that's interesting. So if you need to stretch, go ahead and do so. Otherwise, when you feel ready, just settle into a comfortable posture. We'll be sitting tonight, <clears throat> maybe a little bit longer. And Mesky and I will work up maybe next week for sure, 30 minutes. And that's a nice time if you can do that at home. It might, it probably will be harder for you to sit for 30 minutes at home, but it's okay if it feels messier when you're by yourself. 
So cultivating a posture that feels both relaxed, the body mm -hmm. soft, released as, best, as much as you can. And also it has this quality of uprightness where your heart is valuing being present, being alert, being bright. So just do what you can to bring those two qualities together, relaxation and brightness, alertness, uprightness. And as you did earlier, it can be helpful to take one or two easy, longer, full breaths in and out. Slow it down a little. And just enjoy these few deep, full breaths. And then allow the breathing to continue on its own. It's so nice that we can trust the body to breathe. And let's take a moment, maybe a minute or two, and just be aware of hearing. And what we're doing is just remembering that the mind or the heart can be receptive. And it's easy to remember this when we open to the experience of hearing. And we're hearing all the sounds together the totality of the hearing experience. So we say that the mind is already sensitive to hearing. I don't have to make my mind sensitive to hearing. And we just allow hearing to be, trust, relax. And then bring that same receptive quality as you feel your sitting body. The whole body is sitting and there are all these physical sensations moving, being known. Can the body simply be allowed? Sensations are being allowed. And some of those sensations that are being known, being felt, <clears throat> are the sensations of the breath coming in and the breath coming out. And we don't need to change how the body is breathing. It's so nice that we can just trust the body to breathe. Does it need conscious control? And simply tracking the natural process of breathing in and breathing out. No need to judge it. No need to fix. And of course, this Rhythm of breathing in and breathing out can only be unfolding here in the present moment. And these sensations of breathing in, breathing out, or being known. And it's really useful to let the mind get really simple. So it's just breathing in, being known. Everything else can fall into the background. And then 
Breathing out is being known. And see if you can enjoy the simplicity of the mind knowing the breath coming in, knowing the breath going out. And when this awareness of breathing in and breathing out is interrupted, then simply be aware of the interruption as something being known. So you might notice that your mind is planning. And instead of getting upset, just realize that planning mind is being known. Or you might catch yourself worrying or doubting that you know what you're doing. Oh, doubting is being known. And you can even, if it's helpful, you can even say that in your mind. Doubting is being known. It's just doubting. And then just feel if there's some emotional feeling or feeling tone associated with that mental activity. Oh yeah, it feels like this. So that you're really connecting with the reality of the moment. It's something being felt, something being known. It's like this. It's really a way of manifesting non-fear. It's just something being felt. Maybe pleasant, maybe unpleasant, but it's just a feeling being known. It's so interesting to see how it just keeps changing. Then there's another experience being known. But in the beginning, it can be quite helpful to keep come back, coming back to the anchor of the breath. It just makes it more simple and helps us develop that stability of present moment awareness or the continuity of present moment awareness. But we still have to learn not to be afraid of distraction. Just acknowledge what the mind is doing, what it's knowing. It's just the next thing being felt, being known here in the present moment.
And at some point, when you feel some stability of present moment awareness, just review each of the six sense gates. So just go through the first five physical senses, maybe 30 seconds to a minute for each one. And just realize that hearing is being known. And just stay with that for a minute or so. Sensitive hearing is being known. And then move on to another sense gate. And then after you've done the five physical senses, take a couple minutes at least and just be aware of mental activity. You can still be with the breath in the background, feel the breath coming in and going out. And just notice thoughts and feelings and mental images and emotion and attitude and mood. Whatever it might be, subtle or obvious, mental activity is being known. And we're going to take the last four minutes or so to practice a more open awareness style. So you can just allow the eyes to open whenever you're ready. And as best we can, we're going to hold the body relatively still like we've been doing. 
And we're simply noticing whatever it is that's predominant. You still may recognize the breath coming in and going out. That's okay, of course. But what else is the mind knowing? Well, seeing is probably being known. Thinking. So here the task is very simple. Can you keep the present moment in mind? Doesn't matter what's being known, that's fine. But we're remembering that it is being known, being felt. Whatever it is that's predominant. And it's easy to make this open awareness practice more complicated than it is. We're simply mindfully aware of what the mind is knowing, what the mind is doing. And see if you can relax while you're doing that. Soften. Keeping the present moment in mind. It's really important that we figure out that it isn't weird being present. What does it mean now to be keeping the present moment in mind? And see, it's very important to be able to be mindful of mental activity because otherwise we'll get seduced, we'll get lost in thought. But it's still okay for thoughts to happen, of course. Just know that, oh yeah, mind's thinking this. And now in a few moments, I'll ring the bell and there will be that experience of hearing being known, of course. And if you like that gesture, uh, you bring your hands together, you can. You don't have to, of course. Just, uh, I find it for me personally, a way of showing some respect that I have for my practice and gratitude. So I like doing it, but I grew up as a Catholic, so it's very familiar. <laughs> so I think I'm passing it back to Mesky to kind of uh, open up the discussion. So this is a uh... Just to check in how things have been today, last week, what you are learning here in the room, also people online.
or questions? It might remind people like to, to feel it as an act of generosity. Because mm. we learn so much from your questions and your comments, all of us do. So it's not so much you need an answer to your question. Right. But it opens up, helps illuminate what it is to have a mind. I think the hearing meditation was really enlightening. I usually think about kind of what I'm thinking or what I'm like seeing in my mind's eye and to really hear it felt so relaxing. It felt so kind of empowering and I feel really good right now. So thank you. Thank you so much. Did you guys hear it online? Still kind of hard to hear. If you can't hear, just put a comment so we know. Oh, I see thumbs up. The first time that I came here, I don't know, however many years ago, uh, it was very different how it was being taught. But I didn't know anything about meditation. I sat down, I heard the bell. I'm like, oh, that is great. I thought they're going to ring the bell the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> that really helps. So oh, great. It didn't happen. <laughs> Just hearing opens up things. How did you all find uh, mental activity? It's kind of noticing we are thinking. It's a little tricky for me still. <laughs> it's harder, huh? Yeah. You want to? It, one of the things, especially when you, if you, for those of you who are relatively new, what you'll notice is that uh, whatever we bring our attention to, we want to dominate and control. That's just how it is. So it's almost like a cat watching the hole that the mouse comes out. It's just like the, the knowing mind we think wants to pounce on the thought or pounce on the breath as a kind of dominant move. So that's why in practice, you know, you hear it from Mesk and me a lot, how import, important it is to relax. That whatever it is we're doing in these four weeks and learning uh, awareness practice, mindful awareness practice, it doesn't require mental tension or bodily tension. So when you catch yourself being tight in any way, you can do the sacred mantra, honey, it's okay to relax because <laughs> it really helps. And it's our habit in life generally, not all of us, but most of us, most of the time, it's our habit to assume that getting to life requires being tight. And that's just something we'll have to unlearn. It usually takes time. Even if it's a really difficult moment, does it, do we need to be tight? It's understandable that we'd be tight, but is the tightness functional or helping mental or physical tightness? Probably not. Maybe mention to people online that the greatest their digital hands if they want to see. Oh, yeah. Um, you can either raise a digital hand if you if you have a question or a comment or put something in the chat if that's better. Well, it looks like uh, Emily. 
Go ahead and unmute yourself, Emily. Hi, thank you. Uh, I was just going to share that I liked what Mark said about being able to say uh, to yourself that you're knowing a certain experience in the mind, and it helped me to actually not drift too far into tiredness because I was able to say I'm noticing my tiredness and it actually made me feel a little more alert in that moment. Yeah, I, I think that's really great, Emily. If we only could connect and know what's happening, I mean, life would be so much better. <laughs> Because it would, it would bring down that weight. Oh, I'm so tired. We don't even know that's really what's being known. But we are so sucked in into the feeling and liking it or not liking it. So that's a perfect example. Go ahead, Jessica. Jessica. No, no, I was just, I was just making my face, <laughs> my face up there. I was, I was, I didn't have a question. Although I guess I could, I could ask you, um, one of the things that, that um, keeps coming up is this, um, this, this, this idea of reality. And like this, when you're talking about sort of like the experiences happening in the middle here, and not sort of like where we're touching the board or whatever. Like, like how, when you're practicing, like, how do you, how do you sense that? Or do you have a way of sort of sensing that sort of middle space that you're talking about? Yeah, maybe I'll answer that. Yeah, you know, in a, in a way, when I use a word like the middle, and I think just generally when teachers do their best to articulate uh, the path or the way of practicing, a lot of the language we use um, is offered as a counterweight to habit. So when I say like uh, being aware right here in the middle or the space of the mind, it's to help me or help us undo an unconscious habit of projecting this dualistic notion, there's a me knowing an experience out there. So it's not these words like being aware in the middle or one of the ways it gets uh, a teaching from the Buddha gets translating, translated is establishing mindfulness to the fore is usually how it's translated. But it's not like we're really establishing mindfulness to the fore. It's it's just a way of breaking uh, this habit, this dualistic habit of there's It's almost like even when we're being aware, there's a sense of like, I'm on this watchtower looking down on my experience, you know? And uh, yeah, so we're, we have to undo all those habits. So a lot of the teachings, a lot of the comments and instructions are just counterweights to habits, to break down habits, to realize I don't have, the mind doesn't need that habit. It's not helping. Because being aware, being awake, being free is much more about what's not there than what is there. So it's more like the whole path, spiritual path, you could say, is kind of a stripping away it's interesting, like here we have this wise person, the uh, person we call the Buddha, which just means awake, right? That wasn't his name, Buddha. His name was Shakyamuni, but Buddha was a title. It's just as someone who's awake, someone who has deep insight, deep understanding. And interestingly, the simile he used for the path, you'll like this. He gave the example uh, in one of his talks of a ship being pulled out of the water like a fishing boat left on you know the beach or the dock or whatever and the riggings and the sails and everything slowly rotting in the wind and the sunshine and the rain and the humidity 
and the practice unfolds like the rotting, right? It's like stuff that's not needed falls away. And what causes the unneeded stuff to fall away? Just that light of awareness, you know, just like seeing things as they are and the unnecessary habits, unhelpful ways of framing things just start to fall away, get stripped away. And what's left is just the simple activity of something being known with all the, without all the neurotic tension. Yeah, it's like those examples, you know, that we've had and we hear of people having a being in the flow, right? It's just the knowing mind knowing and nobody trying to make something happen. And life can be so delightful. I remember uh, one of my early teachers in this tradition we used to read from a, a biography of a famous uh, forward from the Celtics, my generation when I was growing up, he was a big time star, Bill Russell. Some of you my age know about Bill Russell. I think he died recently, didn't he? Wasn't it? Yeah, and he was just a great basketball player. But anyway, I don't know if he wrote it or somebody wrote a book for him about his experience. But he just had this chapter about being in the flow. And it was so beautiful uh, of just that, uh, like playing the best basketball ever, like really doing what you need to win, but not caring about winning at all. Not caring about anything, right? Because all of that is extra. You don't want to, wa you don't want to have the idea, I want to win, because it doesn't help you play basketball, that idea, I want to win. What helps you play basketball is being really sensitive to what's being known. That's what helps. That's that helps you raising kids and it helps you being a lover and it helps you being an activist and whatever you want to do in your life. That's the other one. I'm I'm doing this intro class as sort of a refresher, but a thing that I noticed in shifting from following the different senses to um, sort of open meditation that I've noticed before is sort of all along as I'm doing the, you know, trying to focus on one sense or another, I'm aware and, and you know, try not to get stressed about it, but of the mind trying to go through different things and I'm going to rehearse this argument or I'm going to return to this feeling I had today or, or whatever. And then somehow at the point where I'm doing open awareness and it's sort of like permission, like, okay, I can, you know, mind, you can do whatever you want now. All of a sudden it quiets down. It's sort of like, like a, you know, kid tugging at you all, you know, all day, dad, 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 dad. And you kind of say, okay, what? Nothing. You know? <laughs> and it's like the quietest I am when I'm not trying to be quiet, sort of. Um, kind of reminds me of like, if they tell you, don't think about a green elephant. That's the only thing you think about. It just feels that way. Yeah, so I really appreciated what you said earlier um, about, um, you know, I feel like during meditation, I often uh, am judging whether I'm thinking or, or not still. And, you know, having um, the, being able to like note, oh, I'm planning right now for later or something like that. Um, I feel like it gives me something to do with the thought rather than um, to just sit there judging it. Yeah, and one, the, the, the cool thing too is when you use that phrase, like, oh yeah, that's just, the worrying mind worrying, or that's just the planning mind or the judging mind or whatever. Uh, really look or notice the tone of that inner voice. Like when you make that statement, like, is it kind? Can it be kind? Because it can get controlling too. Like when we start to get frustrated, it's like planning mind. <laughs> like, so just like notice, like, is there a finger wag when we're using the mental phrase? 
so you can you can use those mental phrases obsessively or you can use them skillfully and sometimes we err by not using them when they'd be really helpful to use and sometimes we make a mistake and we use it too much and it gets a little like messy in the mind because we're constantly saying is being known you know this is being known that's being known and it it can kind of get tight because we think I got to name everything that's being known. We don't. It's just a way to stabilize, like you were saying. It gives the mind something to do. And in, in a way, something to do that's in alignment with the practice. And that's like you do, this you know, example with children. You know, it's, it's the same thing. It's like uh, we give them something to do to keep them out of trouble right so oh yeah do this do that otherwise they're going to just start making a mess of things and we want that thinking mind to uh it's not actually a problem the thinking mind the problem is that we misunderstand it basically we think it's the boss but the thinking mind isn't the boss it's just nature and the real discovery as your practice unfolds is that there isn't a boss it's just all intersecting natural processes. There isn't no boss and there's no real evil one either. There's just a bunch of conditioned habits. Some of those habits are wiser, but it, they're still impersonal. Even the wisest habits, the kindest habits of the mind are just nature. They got that kind habit, got set in motion. It has its momentum because of causes and conditions let's say you have some evil habits or some unskillful habits that's nature nature too so that could be part of your homework i think meski's gonna just kind of give a little reflection about how to practice coming week we'll be we come back next week or week or week. Thank you. yeah so um we're gonna apply most of what we learned today and the discussion mark, I mean, in the last meditation Mark did, you kind of had an example of how all those pieces came together. He incorporated the breath, the body, all the five senses. And then that's one way of going about it. If you just like, oh, um, normally sometimes the tendency is like you like one better than the other and then you open awareness or you stick with that but the first practice that especially like if you are new to meditation as you are learning whatever allows the mind to settle and be in the present moment would be the one to go to and then bring the other ones as needed but if open awareness is going to completely distract you and you're not going to remember anything, just do the more grounding type of. Um, but in, in terms of mental activity, kids also are a lot trickier than just the subtle ones. When you sit, you could just pay attention what the intent is, what the mood is, um, and just kind of drop it in and what what is the mind knowing and sometimes when the mind is quiet we think like nothing is being known nothing is happening it's like you know just the simple something is being known there it's peaceful maybe it's being known so um yeah just continue practicing play with it and see what works best yeah and next week, Shelly Graff will be here. I'll be teaching on the West yeah. Coast. So Shelly will join Meski. All right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Have a good, good night. Good night, everybody online. Yeah.